pleasure and a privilege to introduce Dr. Aijaliu Newmal, uh, who is currently Associate Professor, Center for the Study of Social Inclusion and Inclusive Policy uh, at the University of Hyderabad. Thank you, Professor Radhika Singha, um, and also the Nehru Memorial <coughs> Library, um, Dr. Panmai and the team for inviting me here today to share my thoughts on Rani Gedaliu. Um, I would like to begin by saying that I had the privilege to meet her in the 1980s. And I remember her adorned in her traditional attire and trademark dark sunglasses, as we see her here in the picture, being helped to walk down from an aisle by two of her Zeliang uh, Rong young uh, nurses, female nurses. Uh, they happened to visit my hometown uh, Tamay in Tamenglong district. Now, well, um, I was also having a feeling, a mixed feeling of awe and mystification while meeting her on that particular day. While growing up as young girls, I often heard stories from my grandfather, uncles, and my own father about her story of bravery you know, leadership, determination, and also her spirituality, but also, most importantly, skeptical of her socio-religious movement known as, known as the Haraka, meaning the pure, and fence from other impurities propounded by her cousin, Haipao Zedonang. She was believed to be the after of goddess, the incarnation of goddess Saratam Dinliu, and she did not attend any formal modern school during her days as any other girls in other societies during her childhood because of the fact that there was no school in her village or in the Manglong area during that time. Her handwritten script resembles Urdu or Arabic scripts. Now one German and two British scholars found it and they mention about her in their book titled The Hill People, published in Germany. Her inspiration to write a script derived from her guru, Zadonna, Asoso Yono, who is known for his book called The Rising Nagas. Now, although Rani Gedilu was illiterate, her words and her ideas was powerful and commanding that everyone who followed her was subjected to her without raising any questions. There was no questions asked when she speaks, when she shares her ideas. She had an absolute command over her people. She was definitely gifted with natural leadership skills and of course with good communication skills. To be a leader, I think a good communication skill is a must and she possessed that from a very young age. And the environment had motivated her to fight the British colonial administrators. She was undoubtedly not only brave to fight the mighty British Empire, as pointed out by Asoso Yono, but she was intelligent beyond measure. Rani Gedaliu was honored as India, India's freedom fighter. I'm sure most of you know about the kind of awards pampered to her or given to her as she rightly deserves. She was recognized by the government of India as a freedom fighter and awarded the Patma Bhushan, the prestigious one, and also Tamra Patra Freedom Fighter Award in 1972, Birsa Munda Award posthumously after her death, and Vivekananda Sewa Saman in 1983, Sri Sakti Puroshkar Award in 1997, again posthumously after her death. She was also, an on, she was also honored with a postage stamp of one rupee by the government of India in 1996. In 2010, the Hindustan Shipyard Limited launched inshore patrol vessel named after her at Vizek in Andhra Pradesh. On 24th of August last year, 2015, the Modi government launched commemorative coin of rupees 100 and circulation coin of 5 rupees to mark her birth centenary celebration. At this juncture, it's essential to be careful not to simply romanticize Rani Gedaliu, you know, but to critically analyze her relevance in the contemporary 
socio-political setting of the Zaliangrong Naga society in Northeast India. The methodology that I use is both qualitative and quantitative. The qualitative method includes purposive sampling and an individual interview of selected respondents, particularly the elders and community leaders, this is my ongoing work, who knew the historical background of the legendary figures Zadonang and Rani Gedeliu from Dimapur in Nagaland, Tamenglong, Tamay, Namdulong village at Infal, Kakulong village at Infal, including the functionaries of Tinkau Ragong Zapriak, which is a parallel body of Haraka cult at Chingmayrong Kabui village, Infal, because I have friends and family since childhood over there, so it's easy for me to have access to the leaders, spiritual leaders in this village, and the rest are secondary sources. I'd like to mention here that she emerged as a spiritual and political leader since Haipo Zadonang, who possessed mystical power, mentored her and popularized the Haraka cult and demanded the Naga Raj, or the kingdom, or in other words, the Liangrong homeland. Asoso Yono also pointed out that when she heard about Zadonang as the leader of the revival of animism and advocacy of freedom, she went to meet him at the sacred Bhubon cave, that is in Assam. And you know, this happened in around 1927. Zadonang could understand and foresee the leadership skill of this young girl, Gaidilu, and therefore skillfully train her as a warrior, political, socio-political, and spiritual reformer. I want to particularly uh, focus my attention on Rani Gedeliu's struggles and challenges in a gender perspective. Now, in spite of facing some struggles and challenges as a second sex, borrowing the feminist Simon de Beauvoir's terminology, she fearlessly fought against the British colonial administrator, including the structured patriarch of the Naga National Council in the 20th century by using Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence. I want to add here that both Zadonang and Rani Gaidiliu upholds uh, you know, Gandhi's philosophy. They may not have mastered Gandhi's philosophy. They've never met him. In fact, uh, Zadonang longed to meet him when Gandhi was supposed to come around 1927 or 28 to Silcha. Zadonang uh, was preparing with 100 men and 100 women to perform a cultural dance in front of Gandhi. And he also composed a song for Gandhi saying, I wait for Gandhi to come to my place. That is the kind of influence that Gandhi have it impacted on these two leaders, both Rani Gedeliu and Zadona. Another thing is, you know, it's essential to mention that Rani Gedeliu did not consciously demarcate feminism and gender in her spiritual and also political structure. She did not demarcate feminism you know, and gender in her struggle at all. However, my point is there are traditional and cultural barriers between men and women among the Zaliangrong Nagas. Aram Pamai, who is a human rights activist, have clearly mentioned that women are often prohibited, even from village councils, even till today, which I think my colleague Rosemary has been actively advocating for that. And in the context of Zaliangrong tribe, women are not seen when wars take place, inter-village war take place. You know, but then as I said, you know, we need to understand this kind of cultural barriers very, very deeply. For instance, the customary law prohibits women, you know, as I said earlier, to participate in the decision-making process and lead the war against enemies, although women are considered as equal. When we talk about gender inequality in Naga society, you know, nobody, a majority of men would not accept because we still acknowledge that there is gender equality. Women are given an equal platform in the society. Women and children, and the Zilyangrong tribe, I mean, women and children were protected by their men folk in the interior part of the village during the inter-village conflict. 
that we do have inter-village conflict. We do practice head hunting. You know, and women are considered precious, uh, you know, to uh, 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 kind of carry on the lineage. So they are protected by their men in the interior parts of the village. If one takes women's hair, it shows chivalry of that particular man. If one brings woman's head in the village, it shows the chivalrousness of the shoulder or the warrior. Because he not only kill people in the periphery of the village, but he have entered to the innermost part of the village to take women and children's head. So that shows his chivalry. Sociologist Maitri Chaudhry argues that the economics, that the economic and political spheres are alien spaces women have to enter. The home is the natural realm where women already exist. Her arguments hold true for Naga women, since for centuries, Naga women were never encouraged to involve in political spheres, although they administered their homes. The recent elections in assembly state, assembly election in 2014, saw two Naga women, but they were defeated very bad. In the context of Rani Gaidilu, she has rise up above the traditional norm. Since she rejected the marriage proposal, Professor Gambungwe Kame has mentioned about the name of the person who proposed marriage to her when she landed up in Assam. Now, in other words, she considered her calling to be a spiritual and political reformer. You know, her calling, using German sociologist Max Weber's jargon, as higher than settling down to have children, produce offsprings, and confine within a domestic space. The colonial administrators used their white power, status, and privilege to continuously exploit and suppress the marginalized Zalyangrong Nagas. Rani Gedeliu, as a young teenage girl, understood the power of confrontation. And she has convicted to mobilize her army, including girls, and fight the oppressive system that used even young Zalyangrong girls and women as forced labor without payment. The patriarchal and oppressive methods of using forced labor, both men and women, you know, in which Rani Gediliu was also one of them. She used to carry, like a porter, luggage of these colonial, you know, administrators in villages. And also collecting revenue taxes of rupees three per house in every village, feasting by the colonial rulers at the expense of the excluded Zalyangrong villages, construction of inter-village roads free of cost, Construction of bungalow made of bamboo and thatch roof for colonial administrators, even to stay for a single night. The villagers were asked to construct a brand new home, and they would have to dismantle it the next day if the colonial ruler had to leave the village. Now, all this, you know, kind of exploitation and suppression of the villagers had profound implications on her mind to become more aggressive and also militarized in fighting for social justice of her Zalyangrong people. Rani Gediliu managed to send across the message to her people that achieving freedom from the Britishers is a larger goal than educational, economic, political, cultural, and social equality with men. As she struggled to achieve her goal, hundreds of young girls and women come to the fore and stood by her side. You see, sociologically, the complexity of relationship pertaining to gender and conflicts needs to be examined. Rani Gidiliu's vision of political power and goal of achieving the Naga Raj or Zalyangrong homeland under Indian Union, this is the difference between, you know, the uh, NSCN and uh, uh, Zalyangrong movement, you know. Uh, because they're fighting for their own freedom and autonomy, but within the Indian Union, whereas NSCN fights for Naga freedom, but for sovereignty. So you see a little bit of differences between the two here, uh, which I don't want to go into details. 
But the point I'm making here is Rani Gedilu's vision of political power and goal of achieving Nagaraj or Zalyangrong homeland under Indian Union needs to be imbued with a feminist perspective. Now, hypothetically, some of the basic challenges that she and her female army, sometimes they may have suffered hunger, thirst, and harsh weather in the jungles, you know, as the man did. But they, at the same time, they learned to hold Nagadao, the swords, spears, and the like. She may also have raised questions about her and other girls' femininity and sexuality, whether men were attracted to her, and how to tackle that kind of sexual attraction in such situations when they're fighting for larger cause. Relations, regarding her relationship with her army girls, she managed to force close emotional bonds with them. She also gained a great sense of respect from both men and women and share a common purpose. In due course of time, I'm sure she might no longer feel the gender differences since she, as a woman leader, marched together with men, organized ambushes with men, and fought along with men, and also tasted the joy of victory, and at the same time, share the sorrow of defeat and betrayal. In other words, she was exposed to the similarities between both the genders, despite the differences between men and women. Well, warfare is perceived to be the critical assessment of masculinity and also to the patriarchal ideological structure in every culture. However, involvement of women army in warfare changes the notion of masculinity to a certain extent. Obviously, there is feminization of you know, women army if you look around every culture. In the sense that majority of girls or women in the army were not in top hierarchical structure, but remain at the bottom. You know, so in any kind of this war, there is feminization of women army. Rani, Rani Gedelio's uh, experiences as a woman warrior made her prepare, made her felt prepared for anything, and that she become more confident since her sense of partaking in Zalyangrong history was evident. She became more courageous and realizes the shortfalls of the British colonial administration. And she tactfully, you know, and very, very tactically reacted to the enormously patriarchal character of the colonial authorities' approach towards this Zalyangrong Nagas. Her feminine character, her feminine identity as a pure chess and mystic woman, as a chief might be, priestess, was critically significant during the struggle against the Britishers as it shaped her efforts to popularize the Haraka cult and demand for Zalyangrong homeland even after India's independence. Now, under her influence, the Zalyangrong Naga movement was strengthened in all the Naga Zalyangrong inhabited areas in Manipur, Nagaland, and Assam. She resisted the Naga's conversion to Christianity and lost the Battle of Hangrum in Assam in 1932. Finally, the British colonial administrators arrested her at the young age of 16 years in that same year from Pulwa village, now in Nagaland, and she became a political prisoner. Naga converts were primarily held responsible for her capture and imprisonment till 1947. Oh, and we all already heard about how Nehru met her and gave her the title Rani. And now the Modi government fondly calls her Rani Ma, you know. And now, uh, so she has actually, after independence, after, after India's independence, she manages to go uh, uh, overground, but again she became, she went back to underground and manages to spearhead her movement in a way that 
is not imagined perhaps by Zadonang himself. Another thing that I want to mention here is the fact that um, she made a tireless efforts to pursue not only the Zilianrong homeland, but to preserve and protect her indigenous culture and tradition. I think this is very important in her struggle, preserving her indigenous culture and tradition. Now, some of the permanent characteristic of the indigenous culture that has not changed with the effect of globalization are the kinship system, the clan system, the artifacts like the shawls, the stoles, kills, and the like. The main objective of Haraka cult is to revive the indigenous cultural and religious practices of the Zalyangrong Nagas. Haraka is considered to be the reformed traditional religion of these cognet groups and believes in one supreme god called the Tingwang or the Rawang. Zadonang introduces Haraka cult with the synthesis of Christian monotheism and the Hindu temple culture. He states that it was a revitalized and simplified form of worship of God and emphasizes on the significance of monotheism like the Christians. Now this cult does not believe in the worship of gods and goddesses and sacrifice to the gods, goddesses and spirits. They were not encouraged at all. Apparently Zadonang discovered the holy ancient cave of Lord Vishnu in the Bhuvan hills of Assam and worship him. Vishnu is believed to be the eldest of the seven brothers of the almighty god Tingwang or Ragwang and denied kinship due to the, you know, uh, uh, machination of his mother. He spearheaded the construction of temple known as Kaukai in Rongmai dialect or Kalumki in Zemai dialect uh, with a shrine, pulpit and isle of bamboo. And one of the most peculiar characteristic of Haraka Kal group is the earring, you know, which is significant in their rituals. It's a must for them to wear the earring. They worship God through prayers, singing of hymns. You know, interestingly, when I opened the hymn book, it's more like a Christian hymn book. And um, also songs, they, they sing songs on full moon nights on full moon day, either by groups or individuals. Uh, share with you that um, between these four cognate tribes of Rongmai, Liangmai, Jemai, and Puimai, the Rongmai people in particular came under the influence of Sanskritic Meite culture and the predominant Western culture. From costumes to naming of babies, ubiquitous influence of Sanskritic influence was quite evident. The newborn infants were given local Meite names like Chauba, Tomba, and more Sanskrit names from, you know, Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana like Ram, Arjun, Shyam, you know, and uh, there are more names, of course, with the purpose to let the youngsters, the younger generation, fit into the discriminatory social system in predominantly Manipuri Hindu culture. Now, let me give you a brief outline of the background of the fact that Manipuri, uh, the Manipuris, uh, you know, became Vaisnavite Hindus 200 years ago under the Bengali Swami. So there is a close cultural affinity with the Bengals, and they're mostly Vaisnavite Hindus. Of course, today there are also groups called Sanamahis, the indigenous Manipuris, who are uh, trying to redo everything, uh, which I do not want to go into detail. Now, today, some people question the rationality of such imitations of Sanskritic culture. On the other hand, the other three cognate tribes, Zemai, Liangmai, and Puimai, were not strongly influenced by the process of Sanskritization. Sanskritization is a term coined by sociologists. These three tribes were not influenced in spite of the uh, overwhelming influence of Sanskritic and Western or Christian influence on this cognate tribes or groups, they still re retain the basic elements of their socio-religious lifestyle. Rani Gedilu's story illustrates a rationality that encourages the marginalized and invisible women to become visible leaders in socio, political, and spiritual aspects that could bring about empowerment, social inclusion, inspiration and supersede the patriarchal structure at home as well as in public space. 
Rani Gidiliu was undoubtedly a beacon for the Zalyangrong people in particular and Nagas in general for showing the way to integrate with the mainland India. She managed to encourage her people to preserve their traditional and cultural heritage. And as I said that she may not have educational qualifications and her goal may not have been planned professionally. However, she remains an icon of the Northeast India since she gives her people a sense of identity and left a legacy that the reason of Northeast could produce one of the most courageous women freedom fighter in India. Thank you very much.